Code analysis is an essential part of the malware analysis process. And thankfully, you have options when it comes to choosing a reverse engineering platform that fits your needs. But if you've been performing malware analysis for a while, like me, you tend to pick one of these products and stick with it for years because that becomes the world you know. Well, Vector35 recently released a free version of their Binary Ninja product, and that got my attention. So the question is, should you consider giving Binary Ninja a try? Well, let's take a look. Now, Binary Ninja has been around for years, but the new free version makes many of the benefits of Binary Ninja accessible to anyone without a time restriction. The free version does understandably have some limitations, for example, in terms of the available architectures and API and plugin access, but it still includes both disassembly and decompilation for several popular architectures, making this a very useful product. Today, I wanna to cover the basics of performing malware analysis with this new version of Binary Ninja. I recently participated in a stream with Steve Sims where I introduced how to reverse engineer malware with Ghidra using a WannaCry sample. I'll include a link to that discussion in the description, but in case anyone is interested in a comparison, I thought I would use that same sample here today. So here on my desktop, I have a ransomware DLL. Uh, this DLL is actually decrypted in memory during execution and includes the core ransomware encryption functionality. So there are several ways to load a sample into Binary Ninja, which I have already installed here in my VM, but the easiest is to simply drag the file of interest to the Binary Ninja shortcut on my desktop. So I'll go ahead and drag this file to Binary Ninja. You have to click start here to proceed. And after clicking start, it will automatically begin processing the file. The status bar on the bottom left keeps you updated about its progress, but in the time it took me to actually say all of that, the bar has disappeared because the file is done processing. Now, during the editing process, I do sometimes speed up the video, but what you just saw was the loading process in actual time, and it was actually pretty fast with only one click. The default load options seem to do a fine job of processing this file, but you can modify those options within the settings. One way to modify load options is to go over here to file and then open with options. When you choose that, you can then choose a binary of interest. So let's say I'm just gonna choose WannaCry one more time here. There it is and press open. Now the settings automatically pops up and you'll see here that you have a variety of load options you can now browse through and choose from. But since we are sticking with the defaults for now, I'll go ahead and close this window and maximize the primary interface to Binary Ninja. Now let's take a look at the overall window here. As you can see, it's a pretty clean interface. Our file is open in a tab right here. So if we wanted to open additional files, we could click on this plus sign here, giving us an opportunity to now open additional binaries as well. But I'll go ahead and close this tab and return to the main view here. In addition to the views that we are currently seeing, which I'll discuss further, you'll also see a variety of buttons around the sides here. On this side here on the left, on the bottom left here, and on the bottom right and the top right. These buttons are basically positioned to activate a sidebar panel around that location. So this first one here on the top left controls this symbols window, which is visible by default and includes all of the symbols binary ninja identified within this program. If you wanna hide it, you can just click this button one more time and the symbols view will disappear. And again, all buttons activate a view around the location within the window. So for example, if I go to the bottom left here, it'll activate a view here on the bottom. If I go to the bottom right and click uh, this magnifying glass, it'll activate a view here. And uh, on the top right, uh, if I click on this X right here, it'll activate a variables view here on the top right. I gotta say, I like the button placement because over time with any platform, you get used to where certain content is located. And if the button to activate that content is near the location where you expect that content to be, it just makes it a lot easier to remember what that button actually does versus having like 30 buttons horizontally across the top of the window. So let's begin taking a closer look at this main view we have here. At the top, you'll see that there are three dropdowns one, two, three, all of which help to drive this primary view right here. So with this first dropdown, we can choose from PE or RAW. If I choose RAW, you'll see this is a view similar to what you would find in a hex editor. So for now, we'll just keep it at PE. The second dropdown has many more options. I'll kind of be jumping around here uh, within these options to cover the basics. Right now we are on linear, which shows us the code. And uh, we'll touch on what kind of code this is here shortly. 
If we begin from the top, we first have the byte overview. This is basically a representation of the byte values where each byte gets a character. It includes the ASCII representation of a byte if there is one, uh, but if the byte value is zero, there is basically an empty space here. It's, uh, it's an interesting view because it allows you to get a feel for the structure of a file and look for any patterns at a high level. And since we're actually discussing patterns, I'll mention that on the right-hand side here, we have a feature map, which visually represents aspects of the binary. The different colors represent different categories of information, including code, strings, and data. Now the documentation includes more detail on what each color represents. Also, you can move within this space horizontally and vertically. So if, for example, I click on uh, in this blue area here, which represents code, and then I start clicking uh, around here on the left-hand side, you'll see that there is both a vertical and a horizontal line that tells you exactly where within this visual representation we currently are. For now, I'm actually gonna go ahead and hide this feature just to give me a little more screen real estate. And I can do that by right-clicking and going to hide feature map. So I'll go ahead and return to the second dropdown now and choose probably the most important view for malware analysis, which is the triage summary. As the name indicates, it provides a pretty good overview of the file, including various hashes and header information. And as I scroll down, you see references to the uh, imported libraries, the imported functions, uh, followed by sections and strings. And you can see that the imports, uh, the exports, and strings are all searchable within this view here. And if you want to dig into strings some more, since this is kind of a small view here, you can go back to this second dropdown and choose strings. And now you have an entire window dedicated to strings that you can begin searching through. And no matter what view you're looking at, say, for example, that I'm in the, uh, the byte overview, uh, if you suddenly think of a string that you want to search for, you can always go to the bottom right here and click on the quotes button. And this pops up a window uh, that you can also use to begin searching for strings. Okay, but let's go ahead and head back to our triage view. So pivoting by imports or strings is a popular way to jump to interesting locations within the code. So let's use this triage view as an opportunity to demo how we can begin code analysis with Binary Ninja. Now in the stream I referenced earlier where I introduced code analysis with Ghidra, I pivoted into code based on the Create Mutex API. So let's do that here as well. Under imports, I can search for Create Mutex. And you'll see we have one hit here, which I can single click on. And you'll see that clicking on that API populates this view on the left, which represents cross-references. Now I'm primarily interested in where this API is called in the code. So let's focus on code references, which uh, are located here on the bottom. I'll go ahead and choose the first one with a single click. And when I mouse over it after having done that single click, you'll see that I get a preview of what the code actually looks like, where this call to create mutex A is actually made. If I go ahead and double click now on this selection, it takes me to the location of the code where we are uh, seeing the create mutex A call executed. Right now we're in the high level IL view, which I'll discuss a bit later. For now, I'll go to a more familiar view perhaps, which under this third pull down is disassembly. And there we have that call to create mutex A. By the way, if I scroll up or down here, you'll see references to a series of nine zeros. And if I scroll down, you'll see nine zeros here as well. These are bytes that don't actually contribute to the executable code. And I actually think it's a really nice choice to just show these bytes horizontally. I know Ghidra would tend to show these vertically because when you're performing code analysis, vertical screen real estate is quite precious since you are scrolling through code. So uh, I think that's a really good choice. Now, if I wanna view the graph view, I can hit the space bar and you see this is now a graph view. And what you'll also notice is on the top, this second pull down has populated now with the word graph. So that is an alternative way to arrive at the graph view uh, in addition to just hitting spacebar. When I'm in the graph view, one of the buttons here on the left becomes relevant to this one right here called mini graph. This provides an overview of the layout of this function and this gray box right here can kind of be moved around to navigate over this larger view on the right hand side. I really like Binary Ninja's graph view. I honestly found the graph view in Ghidra kind of unappealing, so I kind of stopped using it. But this is definitely more enjoyable to browse. And of course, if you wanna uh, zoom in and out, you can just use your mouse to do that, which is uh, helpful and easy to do. By the way, this uh, theme you're seeing, the color scheme that you are currently looking at on my screen is the default theme, but there are uh, others available, including a ton of community themes at the Vector35's GitHub repo. So I'll include a link to that in the description uh, in case you wanna change it up. 
Okay, so I've shown the disassembly. We saw this uh, graph view versus the more traditional text view, but there are actually several other representations of the code that you can access using this third dropdown. So you'll see that there are references, for example, to sudo C, which is what you might be expecting at a bare minimum based on using a Ghidra or Ida Pro. So let me go ahead and choose this option here. And if I wanna go back and forth between the disassembly and this sudo C view right here, I can hit tab and do that quite easily. Now, you might wanna see both of those views at once, right? You might wanna see the disassembly while also taking a look at the sudo C output. Uh, that's probably what you do with Adapro Pro or with Ghidra. So let me quickly show you how to do that. Here on the top right, you'll see a uh, button right here. And if I mouse over it, it says split view. If I click on this, it will create another view here on the right-hand side. So for example, I could choose to show the disassembly here on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, show the pseudo C. And if I scroll around here on one of these sides or the other and start clicking, you'll see that by default, uh, these views do in fact remain uh, in sync. I could even add a, another view here on the right-hand side, maybe towards the bottom right by going uh, to this button, which has now changed a little bit to indicate that the next view, if I click on this button, is actually going to be on the bottom. So I know this is getting a little bit crazy here on the screen, but in case you are using a very large monitor, which many people in this field are, uh, you could, for example, choose, let's see the triage summary here. And now I have access to the triage summary, the pseudo C code, and the disassembly here on the left-hand side. So uh, lots of options here in terms of what uh, views you can look at simultaneously. Now, going back to the original reference to create mutex A and uh, looking at the pseudo C output, one detail I wanna mention is notice when it checks the return of get last error here to see if the mutex exists. You can see the symbolic constants it's checking against, which is error already exists. Some of the other frameworks include the hexadecimal value it would check against, but not the text representation of the symbolic constant, at least by default, which makes this quite a bit easier to read. So besides the disassembly and pseudo C, we do have other options here in this third dropdown. You'll see references to low, medium, and high level ILs. IL stands for intermediate language, and these ILs are basically different representations of the code that range from looking like assembly to something more readable, like the C pseudocode that we're looking at right now. So as you go from low to medium to high, the code generally gets more and more readable. Any RE framework like Ghidra or Ida that includes a decompiler has some sort of intermediate language, but Binary Ninja exposes these, and there is something to be gained from each. Now, the only intermediate language available in the free version we're using here today is the high-level IL, which is similar to pseudo C, but actually has some nice advantages over the pseudo C representation. For example, you can see the name of the argument as described in the Microsoft documentation and the actual value being passed. That's not in the pseudo C output because it's not part of C syntax, but Binary Ninja does have that information and it's here in the high-level IL. So there's actually a case to be made for using the high-level IL rather than the pseudo C output when using Binary Ninja. And that's something I'm really warming up to as I spend more time with this framework. As you're probably noticing, the developers at Vector35 really focus on UI design and optimizing ease of use. If you ever listen to one of their streams, they really nerd out on interface elements, which I think is awesome because reducing the friction associated with accessing features and organizing them appropriately really does make it easier to reverse engineer a program and frankly, more enjoyable. On that note, I do wanna mention that key bindings have their own menu option here under edit key bindings. And here you can create hotkeys for just about anything. And in addition to configuring any key bindings you like, you can also take advantage of the built-in command palette via command or control P. So if I go ahead and do command P, here is the command palette, and you can use this to really access any view or functionality within Binary Ninja. So if remembering hotkeys is a pain for you, you can just type here what you wanna do. Like, hey, I want that uh, feature map back that we looked at earlier. Uh, I could go around digging through the menus trying to find it, or I could just type feature map, and there we go. I got an option to show it. Hit enter, and we have our feature map back here on the right-hand side. And just to cover some miscellaneous features you'd expect from any RE platform, uh, if I, for example, want to insert a comment, I can do so by hitting uh, the semicolon key here and typing this is a comment, followed by enter, and there it inserts a comment. Similarly, in the disassembly, you'll see the comment is at the right location, uh, this time at the end of the line. 
If you want to rename an argument or a variable or maybe even this function, you can just uh, click on it right here and hit N on the keyboard. And this gives you an opportunity to name this function and then press enter. And now you have your new function name. If you need to edit the properties of a function, you can use the context menu by right clicking on that function and then choosing edit function properties. And here you can uh, make a variety of changes such as, for example, updating the calling convention. Let's talk about types. You can access types by hitting this T here on the top left. And this brings up all of the user and the system types as well as those associated with uh, the libraries that are imported by this executable. Let's say you wanna change a type. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump to some code here as an example. So in order to jump to an address, you can hit G for go. And the address I'll jump to here is uh, 100010 DB. And then I'll hit accept or enter. And it's now jumped to that location based on that address. And we'll go ahead and actually use the high level IL here to get some exposure to this view. Now, if I scroll up to the top here, notice this variable var underscore 54 associated with uh, LP process information, which sounds pretty official. Uh, if I actually scroll down to see where LP process information is referenced and actually just scroll to the right here, I'll see that it's the last argument actually passed to create process A. Upon looking up create process A on Microsoft.com, I'll find that the final argument is a pointer to a process information structure that contains information about the new process. But if I scroll back up here to var 54 and take a look at the type for var 54, it says handle, not process information. Well, to help Binary Ninja out and change the type of var 54, I can highlight it as I've done already, right click, and go to change type or just hit Y on my keyboard. I'll then go ahead and type process information. There we go. Choose this first one and click accept. And now that we've confirmed the correct type, whenever var 54 is referenced, it actually includes the correct member as well. So you'll see references to H thread here, D process ID, as well as DW thread ID. Well, let's say that you wanted to now create a structure. I think I saw a structure in a function that referenced the uh, test data string. So I'm gonna bring up the uh, strings view here and search for test data. I see my uh, reference here to test data and looking at the cross references here on the bottom left, I'm just gonna go to the first one by double clicking on it. And then we have the test data string right here. Now let me go ahead and uh, deactivate this strings view. And you'll see that with uh, many of these references to arg1, we are dereferencing offsets from the address within arg1. So it's possible that uh, we're dealing with a structure here, although I don't recall exactly what this is. So if you wanted to define these references as part of a structure, what we could do is click on arg1 and hit S on the keyboard. And then even really without adding any members here, I could just click create. And you can see that the representation has already changed. Now, if you wanna work on this structure further, we could go to the user types here on the top left I can click on struct underscore one, which is the default name that Binary Ninja gave this struct. And then I can start actually working on the structure down here. One neat option is that I can right click in this space now and choose create all members for structure, or I could just hit S again. And let me go ahead and make some space by getting rid of this mini graph for now. But you'll see that it went ahead and automatically created some members and it's got some unknown bytes here that we could continue to work on, but it filled in some members, which is a good start. So this is how you would begin creating a structure. And then of course uh, you might choose to tweak it uh, beyond this process. And once you have that structure in place and you're comfortable with whatever members you are able to identify, you could also click on a struct one right here. And uh, in the cross references, you'll see it now shows you all of the references to that structure. So you could then go to each of these references to continue understanding how that structure is actually used, which is pretty nice. One of the major limitations with the free version of Binary Ninja is no plugin or API access. So while Binary Ninja does have an impressive and easy to use Python API, you can't use it with the free version. You also can't use any plugins. Nonetheless, I do wanna mention their plugin ecosystem. They have a bunch of official plugins on GitHub and there are a ton of community plugins that seem pretty cool too. And I do like that there is just one place to go to to find the vast majority of plugins rather than scouring the internet. And the paid version of Binary Ninja has a plugin manager that makes installing these very easy. So comparing sticker prices for a moment, Binary Ninja obviously costs more than free, but it's like one third the cost of Ida Pro or even less depending upon what you buy. So if the drawbacks of Ghidra are too much for you and the price of Ida Pro and its decompilers are also too much for you, 
this strikes a really nice balance. I also love that the documentation actually includes guides for migrating from Ida or Ghidra just to prepare you for what's similar and what's different. So I hope you enjoyed this video introducing Binary Ninja for malware analysis. Be sure to check out my other videos for more malware analysis content, and I'll see you next time.